I'm Steve Ballard, and this is Inside ECU. We are now in our second century. We employ 6,000 people and train almost 28,000 students. Our goal is to be a national model of public service and regional transformation. We have a responsibility for giving back to the public that supports us by educating tomorrow's leaders, curing diseases, and helping neighborhoods, communities, and our state. This program gives you an in-depth look at our work and the successes that we experience every day. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Inside ECU. Hello and welcome to Inside ECU. I'm Chris Stansberry. In this episode, we'll take a look at a robotic device that could change the way cancer patients are treated. At ECU, doctors are looking at research and new technologies to give Eastern North Carolina a fighting chance against this dreaded disease. It's called the CyberKnife, and it's designed to deliver high-dose beams of radiation to a tumor from virtually any direction. And it will allow doctors to treat tumors previously considered inoperable. But first, it's called Second Life, and it's been on ECU's campus since 1997, and yet most people don't even know it exists. Now it's being used to teach college and high school classes on ECU's campus, but not the actual campus. It's a virtual ECU campus. This is considered to be the virtual world or in-world, and this is my avatar, the image I selected for how I want others to see me. In-world, I can walk, talk, even fly, as well as interact with students and faculty at ECU as well as all over the globe. Everything on ECU's virtual campus in Second Life had to be built and designed by staff and students before it could be used. When people arrive at ECU's virtual campus, there is a map to show them around buildings such as the library and the science and technology building. And what would a college campus be without a football field? Uh, one of these days you're actually going to attend a virtual football field in Second Life and maybe listen to a game. Not all of our DE students can come to games, so again, some of the things we're trying to accomplish with this are to make them feel more connected to the university. In addition to the stadium, there is a pirate ship, as well as Minji's Coliseum, where classes are also taught, and a variety of places for students to come together and meet. Career Services has also been in here. They actually virtually meet with people that might have a difficulty in doing a resume or need some career counseling. And they actually had presentations in here, so they'll have um, DE students meet them in here that need some counseling. You can use voice, you can share movies, do some, um, some video and interaction with your students in here. Students can also click on important information in the Career Center, and it links to an external document for viewing. You may say that sounds a lot like a website, but there's an added benefit in Second Life. Here I would have another avatar with me. We'd actually be talking about what we're seeing, not just me interpreting what the information is. And then you can ask questions as well. East Carolina's virtual campus has representation from East and West campus, totaling about 20 buildings, as well as a separate project where ECU has partnered with the military to address issues for wounded warriors. Fletcher Residence Hall was also created to provide people with an indication of what type of space and accommodations are available to ECU students. But Second Life at ECU is much more than fun and games. It's a learning community, and that learning curve extends to the faculty too. Really, as a newbie going in, I started developing it just like you would if you were developing a classroom on campus. Um, as I've become more experienced in world, I've realized that there's there's so many different things that you can do in Second Life. Dr. Elizabeth Hodge is one of ECU's faculty members teaching on the virtual campus. She designed her in-world virtual class to have all the necessities of a real class, from bookcases, course materials, and assignments for the entire semester. However, in-world options are almost limitless. For instance, Dr. Hodge's Skylab, it's used with management students who came into the virtual world and created objects or images to supplement the course material they were creating in real life. It's a large display board that when you click on it, they actually can do a peer evaluation of one another. Um, so it really makes for a good means of communication. And this is one of the best examples of flexibility in terms of online learning. The students don't even have to be online at the same time to accomplish this. And once they um, access it, then the other students can come back, add more information, and it just creates a nice dialogue amongst the students. Um, I, one thing that I've really found in World is that my students have 
form their own community, uh, whether I'm in world or not. Uh, they start communicating, they share not only about this class, but also about, you know, registration, um, you know, problems maybe that they've encountered with Banner, how to get around that. Um, they, they share, you know, financial aid information and um, scholarships, and they become good friends, I think, as they've um, progressed through the course. I just see this as an exciting um, learning format for st uh, future students, especially with the distance education students. Meet Jessie 77, which is her, of course, imaginary in-world name. Jessie is actually Marsha Carswell, a non-traditional distance education student who lives in Western North Carolina. Jessie will receive her undergraduate degree in May 2009. Almost all of my classes have been online, and this, the class that I took in Second Life, um, I just thought it was more engaging. Um, the, the fact that all the students in my class could gather in one place, I thought uh, it just made more of an impact. You know, we have a lot of social tools, and that's what seems to um, engage the students. They love the Facebook, they love the Twitter, um, the blogging. And what's great about Second Life, it actually incorporates all those elements. Students can also receive a message on Second Life. For instance, if a professor wants to inform a student that their grades have been posted, an instant message can be sent to their phone. Student feedback has been phenomenal. They absolutely, they, they really just enjoy the environment. Um, again, I think it goes back to uh, the communication, their, their ability to um, chat in world using voice, um, the ability to create their avatar and make it look either like themselves or an animal or, or whatever it is that they want to do. They really enjoy that as well. I came in to Second Life, you know, to do my class projects, but I met people from all over the world. I mean, literally, all different countries. It was very um, interesting from that perspective because when you, you talk with people from other countries, you know, you get a whole different cultural experience. Jesse has conversations with students from China about culture, education, and government formats during her time in world. She's also created a book about the tools available in Second Life, which she believes will provide value to others who participate. This summer, for my virtual environment class, we're actually recreating um, Seven Wonders of the United States. And the class will um, take place at the Washington Monument. It'll take place at the Empire State Building. We're recreating the Grand Canyon, um, Niagara Falls, and the class will be conducted there where students will not only learn about those wonders, but then of course they're going to be learning about the content for the class. And this is just the beginning for ECU. Because we offer so many different um, courses in world, because we're exploring different ways to deliver, we're starting I think really to be the leaders at least within North Carolina. And that may be one reason the governor granted East Carolina University permission to launch the virtual early high school pilot program. Other universities in the state have early high school programs, but ECU is the only school using a virtual world to teach classes. We have 18 students in now, three from each of the area high schools in Pitt County, and we work collaboratively with Pitt County in choosing their courses, choosing the students, um, and the students meet in there four days a week with two different classes. So hopefully by the end of it, they will have anywhere from 15 to 18 hours when they come to ECU. Aiden Grifton High School's Katherine Frazier is in ECU's first virtual high school class. Her in-world name is Madeline Calamity, and she says this has made her excited again about going to school. No, because I always thought that school would be school and we'd always be in the classroom. Uh, until the distance learning came along and stuff like this, it's a really cool thing to do and it, it helps other youth like us because this is what we do all the time. We sit at home on computers, so it's a way to interact, I guess. And that interaction drives the ECU faculty too. John Pickard teaches a course in Second Life and says he's really excited about this venture. Especially being that this is high school students that, that we're connecting with, so um, I had a lot of ambitions to be able to really uh, engage the students, get them excited about school, um, get them out of their normal, you know, enclosed classroom type of experience that they've always had, and more in an open, uh, more expressive area where they're free to, to, to kind of uh, express themselves and what they build and, and bring some excitement to their learning. 
And with ECU being dedicated to enhancing its STEM initiatives, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the goal is to pique the interest of students at early ages and show them what tremendous opportunities are available in these fields. That's what I'm hoping is that, uh, that the students are learning uh, in this class and the anthropology class. They're enjoying it. They're kind of excited about it and that the word will spread uh, that this is a new and exciting way uh, to be able to take college classes and, and that they're offered to students, you know, in the high schools um, and they can experience this. And I think, it, uh, I think it will really grow. Catherine, or Madeline, whichever you prefer, took us on a tour to show us some of her impressive projects. Well, of course you see the big flags. Um, that was part of our assignment about two weeks ago to make um, a big American flag, which is part of dragging and making everything line up the way it was supposed to, so you had the actual image of one American flag unified together, and you had to use a lot of math and calculations to figure out how to get it all just to set up perfectly the way it was supposed to look. Being able to collaborate in a three-dimensional virtual environment, 10, 12 years from now, this could very well be the norm. I, I do know there's a lot of larger corporations that are developing their own 3D virtual environments for internal use to be able to conduct meetings, etc., uh, and, and avoid the high cost of, of travel. High school students like Catherine say the ECU professors are willing to go the extra mile to help students. But exactly how does that interaction work when it's occurring in virtual classrooms? It helps you not to be, I guess you could say, shy. You're not scared to talk to them. And, and then some teachers are very intimidating. It's a very comfortable environment. It helps you feel comfortable around your professors. You don't have bad hair days in a virtual reality environment, so everyone feels comfortable with their appearance. And because of that, they're not as shy. I mean, they're, they're more forthcoming with questions. Uh, they don't mind speaking out as much. Whereas in a, in a real world classroom, a student, you know, might be more shy. Pickard says his fellow faculty members should find ways to get engaged with students and virtual environments are where the students are headed. But it's a new technology that allows to collaborate virtually. Um, it's great, it's available 24-7. You don't have to set anything up once you've got the application installed. You can have virtual meetings anytime with any students, you know, on the fly. And you get, with the avatars, you do end up with a more personable um, feeling of presence uh, with the students. You actually feel like somebody's in the room kind of watching you and paying attention. Typically when people are talking about the latest and greatest innovations, they use a term like on the cutting edge. Well, you can't use that term when you're talking about the cyber knife because there's actually no cutting at all. Another way technology is being used at ECU is training the body's immune system to actually attack tumors. Inside ECU's Doug Boyd has more on the cyber knife, the world's first and only robotic radiosurgery system, as well as the amazing work of cancer surgeon Dr. Emmanuel Zervos. Since February 2009, doctors at the Leo Jenkins Cancer Center have had a new tool to treat patients with cancer. The CyberKnife has an x-ray to constantly monitor the tumor's location, a table to adjust the patient's position, and a robotic arm to deliver the radiation beam from any direction. It offers doctors a way to treat tumors all over the body with unprecedented precision. It also means shorter treatment times and fewer overall treatments for patients. The problem in eastern North Carolina is we're fairly rural and radiation is more than one visit. It's usually 10 visits, sometimes 20 visits, and quite often it's 40 visits for treatment. Now, if you live very close to a center, it's still hard to come 40 times, but it's not the worst thing in the world. But if you're having to drive an hour, an hour and a half each way, and you have to do it yourself, then 30, 40 visits becomes quite difficult. The CyberKnife can give those 40 visits in five visits, sometimes three visits, sometimes even one visit. So it's really a godsend to a lot of patients who otherwise wouldn't have been able to come for treatment, who know they need the treatment, but it's just not possible. So we have this minimally invasive way of tracking tumors and offering ultra-precise treatment. And that's what's so marvelous about the piece of equipment known as a CyberKnife. It's really quite unique. 
It's one of the only machines that can do this accurately, do it in real time, and do it in a very comfortable setting for patients. Despite the name, the Cyber Knife does not involve an incision. It's radio surgery, a procedure that uses radiation to treat tumors. So you can walk in and walk out of these treatments without any pain and without any suffering that way. But it also means is it opens a door for patients who we might not have otherwise been able to treat because now we can offer a retreatment to an area that might have failed previous therapy. And this is a whole new realm for us. So recently we've had a number of individuals whose cancers have progressed, but because they had conventionally received full dose treatment, really had very, very limited options. We were able to use the cyber knife on those individuals for pain control because their tumors were so very tender and we found outstanding results. DCU has gone for the gold medal version of the machine. We created a machine, a custom machine for ECU that was defined for ultra precision and patient comfort. And these are the two things that I view as most important for individuals undergoing therapy. Advanced technology such as a cyber knife not only is a benefit to patients, but also an educational and research tool. We're here at the medical school, we teach and we teach physicists, and we teach dosimetrists, and we teach radiation therapists, as well as medical students and residents and fellows in the latest technologies. So having a tool like this really is a great benefit for our students because rather than just reading about it and thinking about it being available someplace else, they can learn about it hands-on. Technology such as a cyber knife is one way to help patients beat cancer. Another is to train the body's immune system to attack tumors. That's the goal of Dr. Emanuel Zervos, an ECU surgeon and pancreatic cancer specialist. Patients that have surgically removable cancers, we have uh, a unique trial for those patients that happens after they have their operation. And that's a trial that involves um, targeting a specific mutation in their cancer. And uh, what we do is we take the surgical specimen we uh, send it to a reference laboratory who then characterizes or um, um, looks at that cancer for specific mutations. And there's about a 70% chance that any given pancreatic cancer has one of the mutations that we are capable of targeting. And uh, if the patient does have one of those mutations, then we have a unique um, uh, immunotherapy trial where we inject a vi uh, yeast vector that has that mutation in it, it basically trains the body to recognize that mutation and then the body then attacks any cell in it that has that same mutation. Instead of using drugs to kill the tumor cells, the goal at ECU is to teach the body to kill the tumor cells. That's basically the premise of immunotherapy, to try and you know, trick the immune system, not even trick the immune system, sort of weigh the, weigh the immune system weigh the scale and the balance, the balance of the scale in favor of the immune system to do what it, God put it there to do anyway, which is to attack anything foreign. The reason that pancreas cancer is such a bad disease is because it does a good job of evading our own immune response. Zervo's team is seeing success on laboratory mice. Tumors have shrunk or even disappeared. Immunotherapy could be a great benefit for cancer patients since it can bypass some of the side effects of traditional cancer treatments such as chemotherapy. So if any of these strategies are proven to work uh, and we can avoid chemotherapy, we can have more targeted therapy uh, without all the side effects and toxicities of what you would consider traditional chemotherapy. When, a patient, when I tell a patient that I'm going to recommend chemotherapy, their first question is, well, am I going to lose my hair doc or my aunt had chemotherapy and I watched her die of cancer and, and so people are, are, are concerned about the side effects of chemotherapy. They don't even like the word. Another trial involves creating a vaccine from a patient's own immune cells. Doctors then inject the vaccine into the tumor and the body's immune system recognizes the tumor as a foreign body and kills it. It's because we believe if we can train the body to recognize uh, cancer cells, it can recognize them anywhere in the body, not just where the vaccine is injected. Clinical trials such as these are being helped by a groundbreaking agreement ECU signed last year with the Lineberger Cancer Center at UNC Chapel Hill. Now researchers at the two centers are working together to study cancer in North Carolina and develop new treatments. For our basic science researchers in Brody School of Medicine, we, Lineberger has opened their doors and offered all of their core laboratories that are part of their comprehensive cancer center status to our scientists here at ECU.
It's research and collaboration like this that will pave the way for better outcomes for people with cancer. We are using the same chemotherapy on some cancers that we used in the 60s and 70s. So this is now the, sort of the dawn of a new era in cancer care. And these clinical trials are on the cutting edge. And, and so in a, in a trial where we know that we can't, in a disease process where we know we can't cure a patient with current approved uh, protocols, clinical trials are absolutely essential. And that's our mission as an academic center, is to find and discover new ways to treat patients with difficult problems.